Well, let's just review again. What's the greatest commandment? Love. That's a, that's a, that's a pretty easy fix, isn't it? Uh, this man is a man by the name of Brad Schmidt. And uh, I was rather uh, intrigued to find that his name was Schmidt. I don't know. Is Anna here? Up there. Yeah. Um, um, uh, Brad and his wife, Deb, live in America. And um, he has, is a Christian. Uh, he is a Christian broadcaster on, on a radio station. And uh, he has a blog uh, called The Schmidt Show. Uh, and it's a blog where he just gets to talk about things that are attracting his attention. Um, I was reading a blog uh, that had as a heading, Google Can't Fix Your Life but you can. And uh, he encouraged his readers to do a Google search for the phrase, how to improve your life. And uh, he said, it's kind of funny, isn't it, that there are nearly 200 million websites and articles on how to improve your life. 200 million of them. At, at the very least, it suggests to us that people are asking that question and they're looking for answers on how they could improve their life. Um, here's another one. How to deal with depression. I wonder how many, how many sites there are or articles there are on how to deal with depression. 171 million hits. We've got a depressed world that we're living in, haven't we? And this is only amongst those who have access to the internet. You see, it, it sounds like uh, a, a lot of people. Apparently, 19 million people have figured it out. And, and that sounds pretty good until we realise that there are over 7 billion people on the planet. Life. What is life really about? Um, well, according to um, his research, Brad Schmidt's research, how to improve your life boils down to two areas. One is a concern about finances and the other, the major concern, is a concern about relationships. They're the two, they're the two biggies when uh, people have researched all of these things. It's, it's worth noting that um, as Christians we have a different attitude to these things, or we should have a different attitude to these things. Um, I, I read uh, this comment and thought, yes, it's worth sharing that. There are people who are so poor that the only thing they have is money. You know, if you're looking at uh, contentment uh, and you think you can get contentment through material possessions, through money, um, you, you're chasing a, a smokescreen. Money is necessary, particularly in the culture that we live in, but it's not the all-important thing. Um, I, I used to, when I was at university, I, I used to be staggered that uh, here we were, had a whole heap of lecturers and, uh, and they all seemed to have it all so together. You know, you talk to them, They've worked it all out. And, uh, and when you talk to them, you suddenly realise they haven't got it all worked out at all. You know, many of them are in broken relationships. Uh, many of them have got heaps of money, they're university lecturers or professors, but at the end of the day, it hasn't brought contentment to their life. They're all the time searching for this 
elusive thing called contentment for life. The Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. Favourite verse of mine. And Paul said that, but he also said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am, I have learned to be content. Brothers and sisters, um, where are you in your life about these things? Are you content with what you have? Are you content with what you feel? Are you content with what you believe? Godliness with contentment is great gain. So uh, someone said, I don't know who it was because I, I couldn't find out who said it, but I agree with them, the most important things in life aren't things. I've jokingly said, I know that's true because I've never yet found a coffin that has pockets in it. We can't take anything with us, you know. Uh, although I did read once that uh, someone said that the only thing you can take with you are your children. And sadly, there are a lot of people who aren't going to take their children with them either. Um, but that's, that's just a cause for much more praying, isn't it, for our, for our children and grandkids. Did you know that they say that it only takes three generations for a Christian family to become non-Christian altogether? Three generations. Um, and that's really sad. Uh, it calls for diligence on our behalf as followers of Jesus to make sure that we are ourselves in a right relationship with God and that we are communicating to our families the truth of the Christian message. Not the letter of the law, but the truth of a relationship with God. Um, just to be encouraging, while it only takes three generations for a family to, be, to get away from God, it only takes one generation to get right with God. So you keep praying for your kids. Keep praying for your grandkids. Um, because God is at work in the world today. And, uh, and we can trust him. This man's name is Henry James O.M. Uh, Henry lived from uh, 1843 to 1916 and uh, uh, he, he wrote some good things and this is one thing that he wrote there are three things that are important in life he said you know what those three things are the first is to be kind the second is to be kind and the third is to be kind um, I wish he'd said the first is to be loving, the second is to be loving because the greatest thing is loving God. Um, but that's, that's what he had to say. And um, uh, uh, this guy here, um, he, he actually had something to say too. He's Albert Schweitzer, who was a Christian missionary in Africa. Uh, I have his books at home, some of his books at home. He was a strange fellow, Albert Schweitzer was. Uh, uh, he had some funny ideas, you know, he wouldn't kill a mosquito and he was living in a place where malaria was, uh, was rampant. Um, but I thought what he said here was good. The greatest thing is to give thanks for everything. He who has learned this knows what it means to live he has penetrated the whole mystery of life, giving thanks for everything. Now, that's Albert Schweitzer. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says, Paul said, in everything give thanks. And he went further than that, uh, bless God. He said, for this is God's will in Christ Jesus concerning you. I love it when the Bible tells me clearly what God's will is. 
God's will is that I should give thanks in most things. No. I should give thanks in all things. Imagine what the world would be like if we were all thankful people. Imagine. Generous, spirited, thankful people, appreciative people. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Well, we look at this subject this morning and we ask ourselves the question, uh, in what way is the great commandment great? I'm sure you've heard this story. The story is told of a little boy who built himself a sailboat, a, t a toy sailboat. Uh, he would take it <coughs> to the pond in a little creek near his home uh, every day and sail his sailboat. A few weeks later, though, um, he, uh, he allowed the boat to get too far out for him to rescue it. And uh, it sailed on down this, uh, this little creek, which then went into a bigger creek and went into a river and ultimately sailed out to sea. And... Uh, he was rather heart struck or heart sick thinking that he would never see his special boat again. Do you know the story? Some do. Some of the uh, people who've been around a bit longer. One day this little boy was walking through the town and he was just sort of wandering along and he looked in a window and there was his sailboat in the window. And uh, so he very quickly looked at it again and said, yes, that's it. And what he did was he then went into the shop and said to the shopkeeper, sir, thank you, that is my sailboat. Can I have it, please? And the shop owner said, nope, it's not your sailboat, it's mine. I bought it uh, and, uh, and it's mine. And he said, what do I need to do to get my sailboat back, says the little boy. Well, he said, I've changed the amount because it said £10. And I said, well, for $20 you can have your sailboat back. And uh, the little boy said, where am I going to get that sort of money? And the shopkeeper said, well, you can come in here every day after work and you can sweep and clean and earn the money. And, uh, and you'll get your sailboat back. So that's what the little boy did. He loved his sailboat, so he went in every day after school and he worked until he had the $20. He had sufficient to buy his sailboat back. And uh, he went in and put the money on, the, on the, the counter and said to the shop owner, here's the $20. And uh, he uh, got his boat. As he left the shop, cuddling his boat, this is what he said. Boat, you're now mine twice over. You're mine because I made you. And you're mine because I bought you. You know, that's a, that's a very old story, but it's a great story, isn't it? Because in, the, in reality, we belong to God and we belong to him twice over. We are his because as creator he made us, but we are his also that as redeemer he has saved us, he's bought us. And, uh, and that's why the, the Bible uh, encourages us in uh, Romans chapter 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And don't let the world push you into its mould. Why could Paul say we should present our bodies to God? Well, because the Bible says we don't belong to ourselves. We belong to the one who loved us and gave himself for us. We belong to God. Not only because he made us, but because he has brought us back.
Before God gave the Ten Commandments to his people, uh, this is what he said. It's found in Exodus chapter 20. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. God, in that verse, I, I don't know how many people read it this way when they read it, but I don't know how many of us recognise that that was a claim by God to ownership, to rightful ownership. Um, he, was, he was saying to his people, you know, not only are you my people because I made you, but you are my people because I have set you free from the bondage of slavery. I brought you out, God says. I brought you out of Egypt. And then the next verse goes on to say, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. See, that was a claim to ownership, wasn't it? And rightfully so. Rightfully so. God could claim that because he made them and he redeemed them or he saved them. So God's statement that um, uh, he made to his ancient people in Exodus chapter 20, he was, he was reminding them uh, that he desired a relationship with them. Made them, redeemed them. You are mine. That's what God wants with us today. It hasn't changed. We are his because he created us. We are his because he has brought us out of our slavery to sin. And that relationship became the basis for the commands that God gave to Israel. And that is the basis of God's commands to you and to me. The commandments of God are another way that God leads his people. The first and foundational commandment is there's only one God and you're to have no other gods before me. These words command God's people to worship, to love and to serve the one true God. With this first commandment, God is making it clear that his people are to have a relationship with him. What did we sing earlier on? The greatest thing in all the earth is knowing you. Knowing you, a relationship with God. God sees our relationship with himself much like a, much like a marriage. The Bible actually talks about the church as being the bride of Christ, the bride of Christ. And Jesus is presented as a bridegroom. Um, that picture is a, a, a picture of intimacy, isn't it? Um, and, and, and God is wanting to have this special relationship with his people today. He sees our relationship with himself much like a marriage relationship. We, his church, are called the bride of Christ. It's not enough to stand at the altar. Uh, I remember standing at the altar uh, almost 46 years ago. And uh, I don't think I'd have got very far if I'd simply turned to Robin and said, hmm... You're my favourite girlfriend. That means I've got other girlfriends, but she's my favourite one, you know. Um, no, the words that I said, and that's long ago for it to be the traditional vows, uh, it said, I take you to be my lawfully wedded wife, to have and to hold in sickness and in health, richer, poorer, um, 
and ends up by saying, and forsaking all others, I will keep myself only to you and to you only. Forsaking all others. And um, of course, many marriages are failing today because people aren't taking seriously those promises, those vows that they make. There is only one God, and that God is the God that is revealed to us in the Bible, in the scriptures. And he is calling us into a special relationship with him. I feel that I need to ask the question, uh, have you allowed him to, um, to be God in your life? Have you allowed that? Have you invited him to be that in your life? There are ways that we can use to measure that. Um, we ask ourselves, where do we set our affections? Um, when we take a break from the complexities of living in this modern world, where does our mind come to rest? I, I brought a thing with me this morning. This is, a, this is my old military compass, and I found it just recently. And the wonderful thing about a, a military compass is, guess where it always points? Well, any compass should always point north, shouldn't it? Um, at least to magnetic north, and, uh, and this one does. And uh, you can actually turn it around and it keeps on facing the same direction. Um, when our lives stop, where are they pointing to? What are they pointing to? The things that we love, the things that we find attractive, will be a reflection of uh, a relationship or otherwise that we have with Jesus. The Bible actually says, set your mind or set your affection on things that are above, not on earthly things. And that's, and that's why it's important that we ask ourselves the question, what is important to us? Where do we spend our free time? What is it that we think about when we have free time? What is it that we long for? What are we living for? What are our passions? What are our desires? We're told in the scriptures, brother and sisters, that our affections are to be set on things that are above. Never lose sight of that reality. The story is told of a, of a young man uh, who's a young Christian, he's just learning the discipline of being a follower of Jesus. And he was wanting to become all that God had in store for him in his life. And so he visited an older man uh, who he knew was a Christian. This older man was sitting on a porch with his dog, taking in the uh, scenery before him. And the young man asked this question. He said, why is it, sir, that most Christians zealously chase after God? Um, during the early part of their Christian pilgrimage. But then fall into a complacent ritual of church once or twice a week. And end up not looking much different from their neighbours who aren't even Christians. You know, he wanted to know, what was it that made the difference in his life? And the young man said to the older man, I've heard that you're not like that. I've been told that you have fervently sought after God throughout all these years. People see something different in you, something that they don't see in most other people. What is it, said the young man, that makes you different? 
Well, the old man smiled and sat there quietly for a while. And uh, he said, let me tell you a story. One day I was sitting here quietly in the sun with my dog. Suddenly, a large rabbit ran across the field right in front of us. Well, my dog, he jumped up. And he took off after that big rabbit. And uh, he, all over the hills, he was passionate. Soon other, other dogs heard him barking and they joined in. And suddenly there was a whole bunch of dogs running all over the place trying to catch whatever it is they were trying to catch. And then, gradually, one by one, the other dogs dropped out of the pursuit. They were discouraged uh, by the course. They were frustrated by the chase. Only my dog continued to hotly pursue the rabbit, he said. Now, in that story, young man, lies the answer to your question. Well, uh, said the young man, I... Uh, what, what, what is the connection between the rabbit chase and a quest for God? What's the connection in the story? And the old man, again pensively, said, um, no, the, the, the young man said, why didn't the other dogs continue with the, the chase? Why did they quit? Why did they stop? And the old man said, the answer was, they had not seen the rabbit. They had not seen the rabbit. Now you say, man, that's a, that's a bit of a funny story to tell. Well, it is, except that there is an application for our spiritual journey. You know, um, I look back over my own life and to my shame would say there have been times when I have been closer to God and I have sought God with a greater passion than at other times. Um, I remember as a young man looking at the older men in church and saying, God, don't let me become like them. They seem to have lost their first love. They seem to have lost their passion. And uh, as I got older, I realised that they didn't lose their passion what they did was they matured. And we're all in that road, aren't we? We're all in that road. But, and here's the biggest but of all, it is absolutely imperative that we hold on to a basic principle where our love for the Lord is something that is real and is personal and it's a day-by-day -day event. So... I have some questions here. Are you in a relationship with the one true living God? Um, we'd probably want to add to that. Are you closer to God today than you were a year ago? Are you in a more intimate walk with God than you were 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 30 years ago? Uh, but we we'll settle for are you in a relationship with God? Are you maturing in your relationship with Jesus? You know, are we maturing? Um, we need to be. I, I remember uh, understanding at some point in my life that you, you, you can't stay static in your walk with God. You're either going forward or you're going backwards. There's no... Uh, dog paddling in the same place, you know. It's, um, uh, it's not a comfortable place to not be moving forward in our relationship with Jesus. Is your passion for Jesus, that's what I wrote down here, is your passion for Jesus fixed in your soul? Lord, I'm going to love you no matter what. I'm going to love you more today than I did yesterday. I'm going to love you at least as much today as I did yesterday. But to have that passion fixed in our lives is so important. You see, 
we look about and see others who, who don't appear to be walking with God. And uh, um, we, we ask ourselves questions about that. Why? What's happened? What's gone wrong? That, that, because if you know Jesus, you know, if you have seen Jesus, if you understand Jesus, I understand why the Apostle Paul had such a passion for what he did. You know, here he was, a man who was once an enemy of Christ and the followers of the way, suddenly did a 180 degree turnaround and became passionate for Christ and willing uh, to go through all that he went through. Um, uh, I, I don't know, I don't know many people who would get beaten up for being a follower of Jesus left outside the city for dead and the next morning when you uh, recovered would feel it necessary to go back into the city and to keep on telling them again. <laughs> you know? Uh, I had someone saying to me this week that they have a shake the dust off your feet philosophy. And I said, well, I can't, I can't come at that. I can't personally come at that. And, uh, and they said, why? I said, well, I know how gracious God has been to me. <laughs> That's how gracious. Very gracious. And so uh, I am to extend the same grace to others. Is Jesus the focus of our lives? He needs to be because it is only then will we passionately love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our might. The first and great commandment and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On this, Jesus said, hangs all the law and the prophets. Jesus summed it up with the necessity to passionately love. Love God and love our fellow man. So my encouragement to us all is that we would seek God with all our heart, with all our mind and with all our strength. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we long to be in that place where you are honoured and given the first place in our loyalty, in our love, in our living just in every part of our lives. Uh, Lord, may we not uh, get locked up in the way of the world, but, but may we truly honour you, give you that first place as Lord and Saviour of our lives. Lord, so speak to us, Father, in this we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.